Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to give you a warm welcome uh, to La Parda leaders. I'm just going to sort of wait uh, to introduce you just for a few more seconds because um, I'm delighted to say lots of you are joining us today. So just let you all come in from the waiting room. So um, this is our second um, edition in the second series of La Parda Leaders. And I'm absolutely delighted um, to, uh, well, take us all out of the gloom and give us a little bit of kind of um, glamour and colour while we're kind of in bad news COVID nightmare and uh, look at where art meets fashion. And I've got two um, leaders in their field who actually have really have spearheaded these disciplines and that is Kerry Taylor uh, who runs Kerry Taylor Auctions and I'll let you know a little bit more about her in a moment and Connie Gray uh, who is co-founder of Gray MCA who specialise in textiles and fashion illustration. So um, a warm welcome to both of you and a warm welcome to all of our um, members and um, uh, people from the La Parda kind of family joining us today. So Kerry and I uh, met a little while ago um, and uh, at Sotheby's, but not quite a, as long as ago. I mean, she really has kind of driven uh, fashion and textiles um, in not just the UK, but internationally. Uh, she joined Sotheby's in Chester um, at the tender age of, uh, I think, about 20 and became an auctioneer, one of the youngest auctioneers at 21. Um, and she then moved to Sotheby's in Bond Street, where she started the fashion um, costumes and textiles or kind of reintroduced them really and uh, in 2003 along with me and a few others she left the hallowed halls of Sotheby's <laughs> her own business as a few other people did and uh, she then really could drive her passion for fashion forwards uh, with Kerry Taylor auctions. Kerry also um, is the go-to person for many TV and broadcast programs talking about um, fashion and haute couture and also has written a few um, books on the subject which could possibly make great Christmas presents this year. Um, oh thank you. <laughs> Harry. And then on to Connie who I believe actually started collecting fashion illustrations as a teenager. Um, and then when she met Ashley Gray, her husband, and both of them I'm proud to say are La Parda members, so uh, that's a particularly warm welcome from that point of view. Um, they started Gray MCA which um, uh, specialises in both textiles and fashion illustration and I think it's probably fair to say and we'll hear a little bit more about this um, that really there wasn't much of a kind of um, uh, collecting field or people didn't really understand it as a collecting genre until Connie kind of brought it to the fore and um, she also kind of advises both this side of the pond and in New York um, and curates uh, a series of annual shows and always does something around uh, London Fashion Week as well. So welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by asking you quite a general question, um, which is really, and um, I'm going to start first with Connie, what drew you to um, this discipline and fashion and fashion illustration generally? Well, Freya, just as you rightly said um, in your very kind introduction, I have had a passion for this subject ever since I was a child. And um, I have always just been enamored by the essence of beauty that fashion illustration is and the stories that these wonderful drawings and paintings um, tell, but in a very light-hearted, very um, simplistic way. Um, they, are, they're, they're, they, are, they, they tell a story and they absolutely capture the essence of every era um, that fashion illustration has been used in publications. But the crucial thing is that they are commercial drawings. So, and that's what always fascinated me was that you'd look at these beautiful drawings um, and they'd be, very often they'd be unsigned um, and they'd be telling a story about the model and the, and the clothes. Um, but there would be no, there, there was no backstory. There were very swift, um, swift, just to the point of telling a story and then you turn the page. And that's what I found fascinating about them. 
Thank you. And we'll go a little more into sort of what we're looking for and how you can start building that collection. But um, Carrie, what, what took you into this? And I think you've kind of uh, really started with very early fashion as well as right up to kind of um, more contemporary pieces. But, but take us through the kind of maybe starting this genre um, and, and building a, a whole collecting um, world about, around it, really, or collecting genre. Well, for me, fashion is eternal. You know, I sell pieces from, um, including accessories, from the 16th century to today. So it's comme de garçon to slap sole shoes. I mean, it's and everything in between. And I suppose that if I was uh, trying to give advice to a new collector who ha perhaps hasn't thought of haute couture or fashion um, as uh, a collecting field before, I would say you really have to go with what you're passionate about, um, what you love. You know, some of my collectors just collect corsets. Some of them just collect Dior. Some of them just collect things that they can wear. Uh, some of them would never wear the clothes, but they absolutely uh, see them as an applied art, which I do. Um, we have dealers. We have every major museum. We have actually dealers, big and small. We, we have fashion houses. Um, we have such a mixture of clients and each person that comes in to see me has their own unique angle and view. It could be buttons, you know, it could be, it could, it could be disco, it could be um, the 1920s, it could be fashion or it could actually be the textiles too, like the, the one behind me. Um, you've just got to go with what really fires you up um, and I would say, um, if you're a new collector, you know, by all means, go on our website. We've got the most incredible archive. And you can just dip in and look at all, especially if there is another lockdown, you can dip in and look at all these fabulous things, that tens and tens of thousands of things from all areas um, and see what excites you and then take it from there. So Kerry, tell us a little bit about what is behind you, because I think it's going to come up in your auction, which is... Uh very soon hopefully it's happening on october the 27th it's um by uh, michael o'connell uh, a british textile artist um who's described as one of the last modernists and it's from 1954 and um it, it's called atomic and it's like these sort of little sparks and these connecting you know the sort of electric i don't know what it is but it's 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 sort of it, it gives you this feeling of, I suppose, of fission. That's what I suppose it's meant to be. Um, and it's in at four to six hundred pounds. And it's very large. It's a beautiful piece. And we have other pieces by him, too. That's my very advert. <laughs> One of the things I forgot to say, actually, is that as you're watching, if you want to ask a question um, and we'll, there'll be time for questions and answers at the end, just pop them in the Q&A. Um, box and our colleague Gillian who is also running the webinar will kind of look at those questions and if um, Connie and Kerry haven't kind of covered that subject then we'll bring those questions um, at the end. So um, on to the kind of the bones you sort of started talking about it a bit Kerry but um, Connie when somebody wants to start a collection um, I suppose a, a good thing is actually how much do they need to spend and where do they start? What are the names that they should be looking for if they want to start collecting fashion illustrations? Um, well, just as Kerry just said, I think that the most important thing above anything is always to try to look for what you love and what you respond to. Um, and so in a sense, the financial side of it is less important. Um, but there are some names, I mean, there are some now some real names in, who are market leaders, um, who are now reaching really quite considerable sums, um, which is astonishing considering, as you um, said in the introduction, up until really quite recently, fashion illustration has been completely passed over by the, by the fine art market. Um, so those two names that I would say are the market leaders is René Gruel, um, who had an incredibly long um, career as a fashion illustrator and is probably the most recognized. If you see a René Gruel image, it's something that instantly is, is recognizable. But he started um, originally, he spearheaded Dior when Dior started um, the House of Dior in 1947, 
Gruel was very much by his side um, in terms of doing the interiors, but also in terms of drawing the 1947 new look. And it really, he had an association with the House of Dior at literally until the 1980s or early 1990s when he died. And the other name I would say is Antonio Lopez, better known as Antonio. Um, and actually behind me, there's a wonderful um, Antonio of one of Antonio's girls who was called Nancy. Um, and we came, we actually met her in, 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 um, in Florida and she allowed us to, um, to purchase this. And this is actually in our private collection because we have a very, um, a rather like Kerry with an archive. We don't have tens of thousands of images in our archive, but we do have an archive which we are very purposely putting together with the very best names. But then, so those are the two names that are really big in, in terms of financial value. But then there are some absolutely stunning illustrators who were working in the sort of mid, mid 20th century, such as Pierre Morgue or Bernard Blossac. And those are much more reasonable um, uh, prices currently um, that you can pick one of those works up when you, find, when you can find them. And then there's literally um, artists, fashion illustrators who you can um, start collecting for sort of 450, 500 pounds. So, I mean, you can go from 450 up to 50,000. So, you know, there's a big spectrum there. Um, but buy what you love, what you respond to. Many people, um, particularly with the older fashion illustration, you know, res respond to it because they say, God, that so reminds me of my mother, because of course, you know, their mothers in the 1950s or 60s or 70s were such glamorous, wonderful women, and they were wearing the clothes that are depicted in the fashion illustrations. And actually, just to sort of pick up on your point, talking about movement and everything, what's the difference between a kind of fashion illustration and uh, if you like a catalogue image or uh, in terms of a marketing image? What, how, do you, how do you categorise well, that? Fashion illustration is, I mean, if, to an effect, it is, a, it is a marketing tool for sure. But where people get very um, confused is the difference between a fashion plate, um, a fashion design and a fashion illustration. Um, and a fashion design and a fashion plate are were much more, well, a, fa a fashion plate is something from, from before, um, but a fashion design is a much more technical drawing, if you like. And that's, I'm very often asked why we don't specialize in that. There are a few fashion designers who were exquisite um, artists in their own right, such as Lagerfeld or Dior, um, but, predominantly they're they're much more technical they're a bit more sort of structured focusing on the on the on the garment and less on the the head and the legs and the arms and for me but fashion illustration is encompassing the the technical of of how a garment is put together so that it can be shown um, but it's also about a, a story as i keep saying um, and so it's much more fluid. It's much more, it's much more alive. Um, you really have the movement of a fashion illustration, whereas a, a fashion design is very much rather like you're looking at me now. It's very straight on predominantly and doesn't have a lot of life in it. But, okay, thank you so much. Um, so kind of thinking about stories and everything um, and where this uh, world has come from. Kerry, in terms of the word vintage, a little while ago, um, this kind of came up in a conversation we had before, that was really about rarefied wines. And now it seems to have kind of become the buzzword for everything. Where, where do you stand on this and how do you define vintage? I think that a lot of, a lot of what's um, termed vintage by especially a lot of dealers is, is very often really nothing particularly special, what we used to call secondhand clothes. And I suppose for me, true vintage is something that's not just got a bit of age to it. Uh, it's, it's got, um, stylistically, it's, it's important, it's strong. Um, so, uh, you know, um, I don't know, a nighty from M&S from the 1960s. I, I would just see that as, a, as an old nighty. Um, whereas something that's like a paper dress, something that was inexpensive to make in the 1960s, um, printed with an eye or a cat or the Eiffel Tower or whatever that you know to me is is something that's more special that's true vintage 
um, I've, I've gone into shops and I've seen homemade things with tags saying oak couture. That's another description that's really bandied about when in fact oak couture is high fashion. It's the, the creme de la creme with hand locked seams inside and specifically made for an individual client. And the fashion houses themselves are culprits too. I mean, if you, for example, come across a Versace dress, which says couture on the label, means it's ready to wear, actually. Mm. It's only if it says atelier that it is actually um, alta moda haute couture. So um, Givenchy is another one that puts couture on ready to wear label. So it can be very confusing for people. But for me, it's just got to have that essence of, of strength in its design for it to be true vintage and not just an old, an old coat. And if I wanted to get myself a rather nice little Givenchy little black dress or coat, what, what would I need to start? What budget would I need to start to acquire something like that? I mean, from our auctions, we, we probably started about £150 upwards. Um, you can buy an haute couture suit by Coco Chanel or uh, Balenciaga or Givenchy for probably around £600, for example, which is cheaper than a lot of ready-to-wear that you'll find in shop now. And it will be by the master. It will be by the creator. It will be by their, not by their own hand, but it will be by their atelier. So um, for me, uh, I think that this market not only is it a great one in terms of collecting but it's just good value you know it's been a lot of it's very underpriced still um there are bargains in every sale always i think it chimes very well doesn't it with the sort of the whole of the antique sector actually that you're not just sort of recycling you're actually reusing or repurposing and these yeah. things have um not just stayed the course of time because of the quality with which they're made but um you know, also they've kind of, they've collected that, that history along the way and still remain very good value and, and are not costing the earth to purchase any of these things, which is kind no. of whether it's a table or a, a dress or an illustration, it will, is all the same, which is. I mean, it's, 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 it's a strange market in the sense that it's, you have this vast area that's really affordable. And then, for example, I think I sent you a slide of um, a Dior uh, Gan Fuso line from 1957, you know, you which we sold for £20,000. Do you have that um, as Gillian to show? Yeah. Or? You should do. Hopefully. <laughs> just in case. Sorry, <laughs> let me just. <laughs> First time doing this. Uh, here it comes. Okay. Have we got it? Can you see this? Oh, that's a René Boucher. <laughs> right, Wait. that's... Okay, well, these are my slides. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, which um, one was it? It was Dior, 1957, red. What? Red, there we go. Oh, okay. no. So this is a piece which would appeal to a, uh, a museum. It would also appeal to a private collector. And it would also appeal to someone who could buy it to wear. So that's why this did so terribly well, because it's a strong colour, great in museum setting. But you're going to have a lot of people sort of fighting for this piece. Um, we do sell things for as much as a, well over £100,000. Um, and they don't necessarily have to be old. Um, I think I, I just saw the Balenciaga wedding dress. Uh, which uh, made a world record price. I don't know if you've got that slide ready. Balenciaga, which, um, oh, yeah. that's it. Okay, so that one is, uh, there you can see that being worn. Something like this, again, is probably going to be destined for a museum because it's, it, as you can see, it, it's so sculptural and that's what we love about Balenciaga. It's got this veil that's, again, streamlined to, to fit in with the shape of the dress. Um, and, you know, again, um, 60000 is not, not an unusual price for, you know, something of this rarity and, and something that's so, it's a fashion moment, basically. Um, so they can be, 
you know, they can be super expensive or they can be very inexpensive and wearable. Thank you. Um, and given that I've just seen that someone's popped in a comment from Australia, so thank you so much for uh, attending from there. Just thinking about where your clients come from kind of far and wide to mm. you and, and to Connie, do you, you know, is there much crossover between your clients? And in fact, do you end up kind of working together sometimes because you're representing two very different sides of this, um, art, you know, fashion and art? So maybe start to Connie first are you um absolutely um first of all kerry is a has been a wonderful source of of um illustrations um through her sales um but we've she we've bought work from her and i know that she's bought work from us um and there was a particular actually it was balenciaga i think by ericsson wasn't it um kerry yes. i think you have an image of it um, by Carl Erickson. It's a yellow dress, um, Gillian, if you can find that. Um, it's got a big red coat. And a big red coat. And it's, um, and I think in your Vogue, in one of the Vogues that you're about, your that's coming yes. up for auction, you actually found the, that one, there this we is, go. Yeah, um, this is hanging in my sitting room. Oh good, I'm glad it, it's, it's gone. Uh, it's very like, <laughs> I, I love fashion. Um, I, what I love about this sketch is that it just, um, it's, it's unlike a photograph. It just evokes so much more, as, as Connie was saying, the elegance, the, I don't know, that, that, whole, that whole style of the period. And I was, I've got some masses of Vogue's in my auction, which I'm um, plugging again on October 27th. And I was flicking through doing condition reports and I came across it, which was delightful for me. So um, that's all, it is always such a joy. That's what a lot of my research is, is when we get the original drawings, because that's so important. Is none of the drawings that we that we specialize in, none of them are prints. The, 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 every single one is the original drawing. So the original drawing that Kerry has here by Eric from 1954, um, that was then obviously published. And why they're so rare is because it, it was commissioned for the Vogue um, for the for the page in Vogue, and then effectively the artist is paid in this case Eric, and then the the illustration more to, more often than not was then just thrown away because its job was done. So when you actually come across the uh, you you source you find you discover the original drawing such as this, um, and then you can then you match it up with you find the publication that it's been published in that of course adds to the provenance but it adds to the excitement of and then when mm -hmm. Kerry has the actual dress um for instance this Balenciaga if she then had this dress in one of her sales because someone's brought that in for her um that's a that's a beautiful unison it's a perfect marriage it is it is and um again the research is one of the things I love the most about my field because um I spend oh so many hours poring over old magazines and photographic archives and, and trying to get access into museums to look at archives too because if i can find um an image be it a photograph or a sketch or whatever or someone wearing it a celebrity even um from you know the 1920s onwards and um, that adds to the value that, i mean it, it's just it is like the holy grail you just try to all the time you know, you, 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 something comes in, you think, oh, I must find this. Or I, for, at the moment, there are some pieces and I, I believe one of them to be Chanel and one of them Lanvin. And I, I know I've seen them in over 40 years of doing this. I know in the past somewhere I've seen them. And so it's, it, I have to sort of then go looking for that needle in the haystack to prove it because if the pieces are unlabeled, that's what I do. Absolutely. And great I think fun. <laughs> it is great fun, but it can be, I'm sure you find this as well, Kerry, it can be incredibly frustrating because as you say, you know that picture, you know you've seen it. Yeah. Um, or equally with us, when we find a, we find it, we, we discover an illustration. Um, sometimes when you look on the back of it, there's lots of scrawling from the from either the artist or the printer or or the or the fashion editor um, about you know what page it's going to be on or whatever. But sometimes there's absolutely no information at all, and that's when it becomes a real a discovery pro process. <laughs> <laughs> kind of the ever kind of detective work, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah. An auctioneer, 
and that kind of provenance is king. Um, on that, I, I was going to ask you a little bit about provenance, but you've nicely gone into that yourselves. Um, but I wanted it to, to sort of give the opportunity and start with you, Kerry, about some of the amazing collections you've worked on um, and the kind of the value provenance can add to, to some of these things. Gosh, there have been so many. Um, I have the, 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 the largest ever collection of uh, Audrey Hepburn's um, wardrobe to come on the open market. And I think that was in the early 2000s. And I think anyone who bought in that auction, they can add zeros now to the purchases because, you know, that's gone through the roof. But that was such an honour to handle this haute couture wardrobe uh, made by Givenchy. Um, that was incredible. Um, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, style icons, um, him especially, that was, that was memorable. Um, but it goes Princess Diana, I've sold so many of her gowns, again, outside of the, the Christie's auction she did, I think we've sold more than anyone. And we keep discovering them because she gave things sometimes to friends or to charity shops. So little by little, we find more, which is always great fun. And then we research them and prove that. Um, more recently, we've had incredible pieces that uh, were worn on stage and from the wardrobe of Bjork, right. including fabulous couture by Iris van Herpen, um, uh, which like sort of couture, they're like couture um, celluloid space alien dresses. I mean, they're just wonderful. Um, and in fact, just last week, the week before, I had um, the incredible wardrobe of the late Annabelle Nielsen, who was uh, Lee Alexander McQueen's best friend, arguably. Um, uh, they loved one another. Um, and she died tragically um, a few years ago. And it was pieces from Highland Rape right the way through to Sarah Burton. And I, with that sale, um, what was important really was the provenance. There were some unique pieces, but actually the fact that she had been his muse, he dedicated the Joan um, fashion show to her. Um, their closeness, the fact that she worked together with him on so many collections made each one of these pieces so much more special. And so we had lots of museums and private collectors, especially wanting to have something from Annabelle's Collection. And I think that that's that's a great tribute to her and her her personal style too. And amazing. I, I remember working with you on a slightly less glamorous um, side of that <laughs> prize that Queen Victoria was as sort of tall as she was wide. That's right. Dresses that came from Castle Howard. I remember Castle that. Castle Howard. I yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, that was an amazing collection. I, I spent weeks in a very dark sort of brick built building in the end of uh, in their garden with with a couple of strip lights in sub-zero conditions and practically needed a torch on my head to go through um and yeah no that was that was that was memorable definitely <laughs> Um, Connie, given the sort of ephemeral nature of some of the illustrations, this sort of throwaway culture, where, where do you source? Um, apart from sometimes finding them in Kerry's auctions. But <laughs> well, Kerry, you... Kerry's auctions is the easy, that's the easy route. That's, that makes me so happy whenever she has it. She actually, she's very sweet because she tends to send me an email and say, look, there's this, this. Um, but no, nine times out of 10, it's literally, as you said about it being a detective, is a detective work. Most of the drawings come from um, people who've worked in the industry, um, either directly themselves, they were in publishing or they were, they were, you know, they worked for Vogue or Harper's or the New York Times or whoever, or their families. And I spend, Ashley and I spend a great deal of time and I'm not joking. Um, like Kerry, you were in a, in a brick building in a garden. I'm very often up a ladder in a, un, either under beds or up a ladder in attics because someone's contacted me and said, I think I've got a picture by, well, I'm not quite sure, but it is, I think it's a fashion drawing. And then they'd send me an image if they can. Um, and then I'm yeah up this ladder and I found the most amazing things literally on top of wardrobes. And they've never seen the light of day since the, however they got there in the first place. 
Um, and then it's then the detective work. But because they are, again, this thing about being commercial drawings, um, apart from, thank God, fashion illustrations from about the 1980s, like um, Kenneth Paul Brock, whose who's, uh, archive we look after. Um, Antonio is another one who kept every single piece of um, work they ever did, thank God, and demanded it back. Um, but any of the early, earlier illustrators, they didn't view their work as, as precious. So, you know, they didn't care what happened to it. Um, and for instance, Vogue, Vogue front covers are, my, are always a wonderful find. Um, and a, a recent one came from, a, from an apartment in LA um, from a lovely old lady who um, was a, had known Gruel but had forgotten that she even had it until she found yeah. it and, you know, contacted us. And because we are the, the, the sort of specialist, the leaders of, in, in this field, thank goodness now people find us. No, I, I bet I, I should think that now when they kind of Google fast illustration, you come up kind of top, I hope. So yeah, no, we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on, on that kind of where, where can people learn more? What online resources or what collections and archives exist that people could um, see to uh, go and see? And maybe I suppose online, particularly at the moment, but also what are the kind of the museum collections that are worth looking at, Kerry? Um, I think uh, there are a few. Um, the the V&A website's okay. It's, it's um, not always very accurate, though. And, um, yeah, it's, it, but there's a lot of things to look at. Um, the Metropolitan Museum, again, that's, that's really a good one. Again, it's not always a, terribly accurate, um, sorry to say. Um, FIT has a good website. The Pali Galliera has a good website. Um, I think those are the ones that I look at. I used to look at L'Officiel, which was the uh, textile manufacturer's Bible. It was a fashion magazine. And um, for years, I was able to just log into that, put in Cardan or whatever, and search through the decades. But that's, for some reason, disappeared now. So I'm trying to build my own visual archive of uh, Vogue. So that's what I, I do of, of, of an evening. Um, but I would say those, and of course, as I say, my website is, you know, it's, it's, it's free, it's there, and it's, it's got so many wonderful things to look at. And Connie, for, for you, you're involved in FIT, I, I think. Are you yeah, I know, I, I am. We're on the, um, I'm on the board of the Francis Needy collection, which is uh, probably one of the most important um, fashion, art, fashion illustration archives, um, certainly in, a, in America and possibly in the world. And it is a dream, absolute dream to, um, to be able to view. Um, the Courtauld Institute of Art, they have a, again, um, we're on, I'm on a, on a, 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 I don't know, a board there. And they have a very interesting um, archive and are incredibly knowledgeable. Um, Parsons or a new school, I think, in America, um, that has a very good archive, which you which can be viewed online. Um, and us, of course, um, we have a we have we we have a we're building this this visual archive. Um, but it's fashion illustration. It's a difficult one to really there isn't a sort of apart from FIT, really, there isn't an absolute strict place to go um, because it's always been slightly missed until and until recently um, and in the big fashion exhibitions that you know are put on because I, I now say that like fashion is so fashionable and for instance the hundred years of fashion at the at the National Gallery a few years ago I was so excited I'm sorry hundred years of, of Vogue um, I was so excited about that and there were there was a there was a Cecil Beaton and I think there were two Eric's in the whole exhibition and I I couldn't believe it because I thought hang on fashion illustration is such an important mm. integral part of the story of Vogue let alone anywhere anyone else um so but you are beginning to see more there was a there was an exhibition at the Denver Fine Art Museum recently that was dedicated to one specific fashion illustrator um, otherwise, the Society of Illustrators in New York. Now, that is a very beautiful, um, it's a very beautiful uh, museum, small museum, but also has a wonderful archive. And I really recommend anybody, they have a great restaurant as well, anybody who's in, uh, lucky enough to be in New York in the next 
10 years, shall we say, um, <laughs> should absolutely um, visit the Society of Illustrators because they have an amazing um, archive. I meant to ask you, and I haven't, is in terms of displaying and hanging illustrations, presumably it's the same sort of rules as kind of drawings in that if you can have glass that it, you know, has a UV filter and things like that. But what's your kind of um, preferred way of showing really in framing? And well, I absolutely believe, because I believe they are fine art, um, I, we, we, I frame all our works. Um, behind, obviously, if they need to be um, slightly helped in terms of conservation, you know, we have them, uh, we have a, a very excellent paper conservationist um, and then they're, they're laid down if necessary. Um, and then, yes, absolutely. Everything is to exhibition um, or museum quality of, of glass and all of that. Um, but I'm not, I, but I, at the same time, I don't want people to be precious about fashion illustration in terms of I want it to be on people's walls. I want people to to enjoy it, just like Carrie's got that Eric on her wall in her sitting room. Um, it's something to be absolutely enjoyed and and um, and looked at, and not to be tucked away. Don't tuck fashion illustration away. Put it on your walls. <laughs> and, and you, in terms of, I mean, obviously, some things, as you say, people buy it to wear. Sometimes it's for museum collections. Um, if you are an amateur collector so you're not in a kind of a museum conditions how how should you kind of keep people you know keep the moths away as part of anything else as <laughs> well they're a bit of a problem i mean i would say that um if if you're a new collector try and buy something that doesn't need con conservation work try and buy something that's easy to begin with conservation is expensive and it, although you'll get something much cheaper it may not be worth it in the long run um, don't cut the things um, never cut something if you have to make something smaller make a tuck or whatever but make it reversible once you cut into a garment that's you kind of that's it really um, I would uh, keep moth traps in the wardrobe room <coughs> excuse me um they'll they'll um they're like sticky strips and the male moth will um fly in they've got pheromones and they'll stick to it and that you'll obviously you'll you'll kill those male moths um but what it will do is it will alert you to that you've got moths and they're and what you what you see you've got those horrible little yellow caramel colored wing things stuck to there you really have to fumigate as well yeah. If you find you've got moth in a garment, you should put it in plastic and then put it in the freezer for three weeks. Three weeks. Or, <coughs> excuse me, um, if you've got, um, you, dry cleaning will also kill moths. But if you've got tons of it, it, it's better to get a chest freezer and just put everything in there for three weeks. Okay. And just keep monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. Unfortunately, once you get moths, you can very rarely get rid of them completely, unless you have no carpets and no curtains. And But things like beds, they love. So if they get out of your wardrobe into your bed, you're probably stuck with them for a long time. <laughs> you can get them heat treated. There's a place called Thermalignum in London, and you can, get a, you can hire a van and you can get your bed and you can take it. And they, what they do is they treat it at a very low temperature so you can kill moths that way. But obviously that's super expensive. Um, I've had to do that myself and it's super expensive. And um, you hope it works. That, that should kill the eggs, that should do. It's the eggs that are the problem because uh, once they, the larva hatch, that, that's when the damage happens. They start eating their way through. So, so that, those okay. are some top tips on moths. It's very good. And, and I'm sure Lakeland will employ you for testimonials soon for all of their, their moth products. Um, before we go on to take some of the questions, I've got one last question for you both. So I think I'll start with Connie. What's the most exciting thing you've handled to date? And what is the holy grail that you're still hoping or itching to get your hand? Oh, um, the holy grail, basically, because I know this is a really, this is rather a bizarre answer. 
But because fashion illustrations, the original ones, are so rare, and for instance, Drawing on Style, which is this um, exhibition that we put on um, every year during Fashion Week in London and, and New York, um, it takes at least 18 months or two years to, to, to bring this, this illustration show together because they are so difficult to come by. You know, it is not a question of just um, going to, uh, just finding them willy nilly. So any fashion illustration by any of the mm. artists of, from the 20th century is just a joy. And I get, literally, I get um, uh, shivers down me, especially when I recognize it. So works by Gruel, by Boucher, by um, uh, Eric. Um, but then also, I, we now work with contemporary illustrators, the very top masters, or what I consider to be the masters of fashion illustration. And we re recently have started working with the most wonderful American um, illustrator who worked in the predominantly the 70s and 80s called Stephen Stippleman. I think there may be an image that you could pull up. Um, it's called Intensity. Now, when I first came across here, when I met him in New York um, bef just before lockdown, and was privileged to be taken into his studio and seen the incredible work. That was a holy grail moment. Um, and um, Bill Donovan, who is the Dior, he's the currently the, the fashion, uh, the artist in residence for Dior. Um, again, there should be a picture um, that is available to view. Um, I feel so privileged to be working with these with these artists who are working today and who are really are the absolute they they're leading the the the, the fashion or for fashion illustration because it is beginning to become much more um, fashionable again and is the perfect genre or medium <laughs> for fashion at the moment of course because um, runway shows aren't taking place <laughs> you only need there's no, you know, photographers can't work because they have to have stylists and, and lighting people and makeup and da -da -da -da, hair. Whereas a fashion illustrator, literally him or her in a room <laughs> with a model, or if you can't be in the room with a model, you can be doing it like we're doing it right now. David Downton has just done a series um, for this latest uh, fashion week. Um, and he did the whole thing on Zoom as far as, I, as, far as I'm aware. And it's just so exciting to see these, these clothes, whether they're <coughs> Dior 2021 or whether they're Dior 1947, um, be brought to life in an artistic manner. Amazing. Thank you. And, and Kerry, what about you? In the, all the, can you pick one thing or is that too hard? <coughs> it's really hard. I think, I think the thing that makes me most proud is when I go to the Victoria and Albert Museum and I see, and in fact, most museums in the world, when they have an exhibition, there's, us, there's usually at least one KTA piece, if not more. I mean, that gives me a huge thrill. But um, I remember taking my sons uh, to the v when they were, they, they were smaller and there's this fabulous wedding suit, which is 1673, uh, made of brown wool covered in gold and silver passementary lace and has these massive big balloon shaped uh, breeches, very long skirt um, with this embroidered garter badge which belonged to King James when um, he was waiting for his bride to be. It was his wedding suit. He went to Dover Beach and he stood there with a the light twinkling on the lace uh, waiting for Mary Modena of Modena to um, you know, get off the boat basically and, and be become his new young second wife. And I think I love that piece because it's uh, menswear, which is rare. It's a beautiful object. It's so rare and it has this wonderful provenance, the romance. It's, it's royal, it's romantic, it's, it's, it's just so dandyish and outrageous and wonderful and warm, it's sensible, no silk, wool, wool, warm wool. And I just love that. And the fact that it's there, that just, oh, I'm just so, I'm, and so many of these things are, I, it's just so wonderful for me. Um, I think in terms of, oh, what would I love to find? It's so difficult. Um, oh, trying to think. I'd love a Paul Poiré lampshade dress, maybe, from uh, 1911. Um, I think that would be amazing. 
that's a very fragile thing. So the chances of me finding one of those are sort of next to nothing. Um, and really, you know, maybe a, a 1947 bar ensemble, uh, Christian Dior's Corolle line, his New Look line in 1947. Um, most exhibitions show reproductions of that. And I'd really love to find the real thing. That's what I would love to find. One of those, just one complete <laughs> bar suit. Well, yeah, hopefully everyone's hearing that. Maybe, maybe that. <laughs> Um, Gillian, you're obviously having a little trouble with the slides, but are you able to do the, the Q&As and extract some questions or would you like me to have a look? Are you yes, I, I have the questions here. Um, so we'll start with one for Connie, um, which someone said that they love fashion illustration, um, but they would like advice on how to use them at home. Uh, can I have more than one together on a wall, even if they are different styles? Oh, absolutely. Fill your walls. Um, and that's something that we love about fashion illustration is that you can hang it not just against fashion, not like side by side with fashion, another fashion illustration, but you can hang it alongside any different genre of art. I've seen fashion illustration in bathrooms. I've seen it in kitchens. I've seen it in drawing rooms. I've seen it in dining rooms. It works in every room in the house. Um, and just have fun with it. I, when I'm hanging drawing on style, for instance, um, whether it's in London or New York, I'm always slightly looking for a story. So I slightly take, I'll take a color theme if necessary, just to try and just so that, and, but it can be different. It can be a 1940s work against the 1980s or a 2010. Um, just so long as there's a sort of there's a story, there's a, there's a sort of flow between them, I would say. And if you frame them in the same, if you do the same framing, that obviously always helps to tie, to tie a, a, a different, a, different pictures together. Thank you. Um, Gillian, is there, an, an, I think we probably have time for two, two, two or three more questions. Before we wrap it. So if this one is for Kerry. Um, if you're buying vintage to wear, how how is best to clean um, garments? It it really depends what it is. There's no one 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 rule fits all kind of thing. I mean, if it's cotton, you can probably wash it. Um, <clears throat> if it's silk, uh, would probably need a specialist dry cleaner. Um, it just depends what it is, really. Um, uh, I think. Um, Cotton things are fairly sturdy, so you should be able to at least hand wash them. Um, I, I probably avoid washing machines uh, where possible. But other than that, I think it's just common sense. Great, thanks. Um, and then another one for Connie. Um, what is your, do you have a favorite fashion illustration and what does it transmit to you when you look at it? Do I have one particular fashion illustration or, or an artist? Um, I think you could answer that that either way or what, what um, does it, yeah, uh, it? One particular, no, can't, there's too many. Um, but my my absolute loves is um, Eva René Boucher from the 1940s and 50s. And I don't know if you can pick up a slide there. It's Elizabeth Arden um, and there's a girl with her hand on her face. And it's the original, it's the original, um, I, I just think that is just so of its period. It's 1949 um, and that was plastered all over Vogue, Harper, Harper's, every magazine um, during that period. And that was what the beautiful women would be wearing. And I just love, it just evokes a woman getting ready. She's, she's just, oh, it's just perfect. Um, and it's an advertising piece, which is slightly unusual. Um, Otherwise, um, if we go to Bill Donovan, Schiaparelli, which is a, yeah, oh, Boucher, hang on, just go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, that one. Um, that is um, 19, that is 1947-48, that is the new look, which Kerry was just talking about. Um, I just adore that by René Boucher. And then coming right into sort of more today's world, um, if you go to, that's René Gruel, he's the sort of great master. Uh, this is Stephen Stippelman, I was just talking, oh, go back one, uh, that one. 
Stephen Stippleman, um, works in paint only, very unusual. He's the one in New York that I came across earlier this year as, as the, have the whole archive, which is incredible. And then just go to Yellow, a Yellow Bill Donovan, keep going, that one. Um, he, every time I see his work, I'm lucky enough to see him. We, we run a lot of masterclasses with him, um, but also I'm lucky enough to see him work in his studio. And I am breathless with Bill's work every time. The stature of that is just extraordinary. Brilliant, thank you. Um, there was uh, a, another thing I sort of picked on, uh, Julian, for Kerry, I think, is that if you were going to start collecting vintage fashion, what would be the sort of first thing you should buy? The start, obviously something you <laughs> like, but what would be a kind of a good piece to build a collection around? Is this for wearing or for collecting? Well, that is not entirely specific on the question. So you answer it how you would like, I would say. Okay, well, again, it's really difficult. It goes back to me saying, you know, it's got to be just something that you love and you build, a, you build around that. Um, I have, I, I'm just thinking of a, a friend, a client of mine. She will only buy things that she wears she um she'll choose things that are in good condition that fit her that don't need alteration and um she likes very glamorous evening wear and so and she has a penchant for black and gold and uh, uh luxury furs and things like that so that could be one one way to go um, and again all of these are accessible from 150 pounds upwards 150 pounds 100,000 pounds and anywhere in between if it's someone who wants to just collect as a as a, a work of art, then I would go for really fine pieces by the masters, again in good condition. Um, try and avoid black. Try and go for strong colours, uh, because again these display well. And most people who collect fashion ideally have an eye to display at some point or other rather than just having it in the wardrobe and something sculptural. So maybe Balenciaga would be a good one to start with. Uh, you could start with an inexpensive little suit and then work your way up from there. Perhaps mm -hmm. that would be a good one. If you love Christian Dior and you can't afford haute couture and very few of us can um, at the upper levels, um, again, Christian Dior London's very affordable. Mm -hmm. And these are the uh, oak couture designs that have been made as ready to wear from 1953 onwards in London. And they're great. So you get all of the Dior style and the look. You don't have the hand finishing, but it's true Dior design. And those are both wearable and collectible. So that might be a good one. It's the name out, doesn't it? Keep, I mean, it's those signed pieces. Um, and I can I just interrupt, which is a slight plug for Grey MCA, but as Kerry's talking about um, Dior, um, on the 12th of November, we have an amazing fashion illustrator called Gladys Parent Palmer. Um, and we're running a series of fashion illustration masterclasses, virtual, obviously. And she is going to be focusing on the, the Dior from early days when Dior was working um, under uh, Piquet and Le Long, and then through, uh, obviously, New Look, and then after his death, for instance, Mark Bolan, I think it was Mark, well, it was Mark Bolan, wasn't it, Kerry, who was, who did London, uh, Dior London before he was appointed he, creative director. That's right, he did, yeah. yes, exactly. Um, so he went from, he was, initially he was, yeah, Dior London, and then he was appointed main designer or creative director for Paris. Um, and so Gladys is going to be illustrating the entire history of Dior um, from his early days right up until the, literally last week's or two weeks ago's runway show um, in Paris. So please, anyone who's right. interested in fashion illustration, fine art, fashion, all of those things, um, just look on our website and you can join the masterclass. Thank you so I, I much. I will do, I will do that. Very cheeky. I'm sorry to do that plug. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that what we'll probably do is when we put the link of this up, we'll, we'll mention the auction and your event and then links to your websites as well. Um, because so people can continue to kind of see more um, and hopefully start investing in some of these things. Um, so it's 
remains for me to say thank you so much. Uh, the time has gone very fast, but it has been wonderful, I think, to bring a little bit of glossiness and colour um, as the you know days draw in, it gets colder, and we're going to be in more. Hopefully, we can just you know parade around in our finest dresses at home. Um, you know, who needs to wear lamb? Kind of get glamorous. Uh, wherever we are, I think. Um, and uh, I will certainly be tuning in uh, for the masterclass and I will also be watching the auction. I think there's also some rather lovely uh, job lots of Vogue if you want to kind of while away uh, the hours of that as well. So thank you very much, Connie and Kerry. Thank you to Gillian working in the background. I'm sorry that the slides were proving a little bit more challenging. Um, and thank you as well to our partner, Cultural Communications, who um, we work with on this Lepardis series so um hope to see you again soon thank you for tuning in and have a good rest of the day thank you bye. so much bye